Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And the vocation is a calling or a work. And uh, your vocation is witnessing and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Your calling, your job, your hobby is making a living. Now, I'm not being funny. Your hobby is making a living. That's your sideline. And uh, talking to David today, Dave and I were talking, he says, I come to church four times a week, now I'm coming to men's prayer meeting at the Bible study. He said, can't we have more church? He wants more church. Hey, that's a blessing, isn't it? Amen. He just he, he said, all I live for, Sunday, and then I think, oh boy, Monday and Tuesday. But church is Wednesday. He gets all happy. And then Thursday, Friday night Bible study, he's got something to look forward to. And then he said, oh, then a Friday. But then it's real quick, just a short space, then I got Saturday night men's prayer meeting. <laughs> And then Sunday, it's all day long. I get it all day long. I thought, that's a blessing. Now it's good. He's got a first love. He's excited. He's, the word's getting in him. He wondered if something was wrong with him. No, man, so that's good. That's something right with you. But he, it says here, I beseech you, therefore, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And uh, like I said, your job is witnessing, and your hobby is making a living. Now, I mean that. I mean with all my heart, I believe that. Verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness. The Lord had to say that, didn't he? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Forbearing means putting up with each other. And so he says, with lowliness and meekness, humility, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, with all meekness and uh, lowliness and long suffering and forbearing. You know, Christians need to be able to put up with each other. I mean, listen, that's going to be the place where the devil gets in to mess us up. And we just get kind of, just kind of rub each other wrong. You know why people, Christians rub each other? they got convictions. They believe something. They say, well, the Baptists are always splitting. Well, it's because they believe something. You never heard about the Lutheran splitting and the Methodist splitting and the Catholics. You know what I mean? You don't hear about that. They don't believe anything. The Episcopal, they don't believe anything. But we believe something. So that because of that, you need to forbear with one another, put up with each other, be long-suffering and patient. And to come in with a meek and humble mind about the thing. He says in verse 2, With all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, endeavoring. Endeavoring means to work at it. You have an endeavor. When you endeavor to do something, he said endeavoring, to work at it, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now when he says unity, he didn't mean the ecumenical movement. He didn't mean the ecumenical movement. He meant the unity of the Spirit and believing the truth. You're one in the truth and in the Word of God. And so endeavoring means to work at it. We need to constantly keep in mind before and after the services, you know, when people are walking around, be very careful. You know, we always got something planned to say to somebody. Well, they just, if they say this, I'm going to say this. You know, we're, ready to, we're ready just to really cream somebody good with the Word of God or slam them with some, something. You know, we're ready to do that to somebody. Always ready to say something. And that's not it. It's endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, working at it. You say, but that's hard, preacher. That's hard for bearing one another and endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Well, verse 7 will help you. But unto every one of us is given grace. You say, God will give you grace to do it. And you need grace to do it. You need lots of it. He says, verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He's a southerner, you all. <laughs> and, uh, well, Paul, Paul was. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He was in the southern tribes. He's you all. He said, you all just keep it straight now. <laughs> But he says in verse 4, there is one body. Now, when he's talking about, we know there's many bodies. Now, you've got to get this thing straight. Because a lot of people just completely go bananas when they get to this passage for several reasons. They say, see, there's one body. And people say there's no such thing as a local church. And they abandon the local church like the two-by-twos, the Sparkites. They come from the Sparkites, and they're real heavy in South Dakota. I was surprised they were here. And I never heard of them until I got to South Dakota. And they don't believe in a local church, taking an offering, a pastor, nothing. And uh, you know, that's not right. They, they just believe in the universal body. I believe that. But I also believe in the local church. I believe in heartily. It's right. There's offices of the local church, and there's a type of collection. There's a pastor. There's a place where you get together and preach the word together, and it's right. The church that met in their house. And there's a local churches. So when it says one body, it's talking about the body of Christ. For example, for by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. 
And how do you get into that one body? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not water baptism. And these other Baptist preachers just crack at this point, and they say it's water baptism that puts you in the local church. And they say there's only the local church. And if that's true, then the local church is the bride of Christ. And if that's true, then when the rapture takes place, just the people that have been baptized into a local church and members of the body go up. And there's a split rapture, and the other ones stay behind. And that's just, I mean, that's how you have to take it to its logical conclusion, and that's wrong. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit. Now, we know there's many spirits, but there's one important one. We know there's many bodies, but see, those many bodies make up one body, which is the body of Christ. And so there's one body, there's one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. What is that? The hope is always the second coming. Looking for that blessed hope of the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13. One hope of your calling. Now when he says one spirit, notice he says one spirit, and then he comes down verse 5, one Lord. Now you know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8.5? There's many lords. 1 Corinthians 8.5 says there's many lords. You can read it sometime, 1 Corinthians 8.5. But here it says one lord. What's that mean? There's one you better have. And there's a bunch you better avoid, <laughs> is what he's saying. One lord, one faith. You've heard people say there's many faiths. Yeah, but there's one you better have or you go to hell. You see, there's many faiths. And when somebody says, oh, there's a lot of faiths, well, then that's the time to say there's one faith. And you better get the faith. And fake fact, take the book of Ephesians to show it to them. Don't go far. Just turn one page and say, here's the faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. That's the faith. <laughs> if there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. <laughs> one baptism. When I say baptism, I'm kidding the Campbellites and the water dogs because they always say, repent and be baptized. They can't even say it right. You know the Lord messes up your speech when you're a heretic and you can't talk right. I'm t you can tell a heretic he can't say it. He says, he'll say, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. He can't say Holy Ghost. he got to say, Holy Ghost. Be, repent and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and then they can't talk right anymore. You ever hear somebody get the go, the spit it. The spit it. You ever hear somebody say, the spit it. Something's wrong with that guy, man. It's spirit, not spit it. I've heard, I've heard teachers at... Where I went, you know, they say spit it. <laughs> you know, they're real Greek and Hebrew professors, and they think they need to say it just with an accent to make you think that they're somebody. And they're nobody. They're just lords messing up their speech so you can tell they're a nut. <laughs> and I really mean that. <laughs> you watch the thing. It comes true every time. <laughs> he says in verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. <clears throat> now, when he says one baptism, it's certainly not water baptism, as you have the common, I mean, listen, 90% of the Baptists say it's water. So, man, don't you know we're in a mess unless we can explain this thing. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter uh, 6. Turn to Hebrews 6. They say, oh, one, one baptism, that's water. No, it's just like the rest of them. There's many lords, there's many faiths, there's many bodies. In fact, there's many gods. The Bible said, lords many and gods many, 1 Corinthians 8, 5. Um, Turn to Hebrews 6, 2. Uh, look at verse 1. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of what? Baptisms, plural, and of laying on of hands on the resurrection of dead and eternal judgment. <clears throat> the doctrine of baptisms. And I've showed this to Baptist preachers. You know what they say? Oh, in the Greek, that word baptism means washings. And had to do with Old Testament carnal ordinances of washings. Well, if it, if it meant that, then the Lord should have said that. And he didn't mean that. And we've, we've got a good foundation on that this morning. He said the doctrine of baptisms. There are seven baptisms in the scripture. Different and distinct from each other. Seven different baptisms. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3. I've got a tape on this in my office. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, I've got two different tapes in my office that if you want to really get it heavy in a, in a detail, I've got a tape called Seven Baptisms, and I teach the thing for an hour. Uh, Roxanne just listened to that recently. Seven Baptisms. I have another tape called The uh, Filling and the Baptism. The bapti I start like this. The Baptism and the Filling of the Holy Spirit. The Baptism and Filling are not the same. And you need to get a hold of that or you'll get mixed up in your doctrine with the charismatics and all this. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, and look at verse 11, Matthew three eleven. 
I look at 10 first. Matthew 3.10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the circle at fire. Now he said there, he said, circle, uh, circle that word fire. And he's talking about uh, verse 7, Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you generation of vipers? He's talking about them being as type of trees, and they have they don't bear, they're not bringing forth fruit. Now the last word in verse 10 is fire. That's judgment. Verse 12, or 11. I indeed baptize you with water. There's John's baptism. That's one baptism, John's baptism. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He, Christ, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, there's the second baptism, comma, and with fire. What's the fire? It's not tongues of Acts 2. It said cloven tongues like as of fire. It didn't say fire. And over there, uh, later on, now listen, before we turn away, <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 5 he said, he'll send you the promise of the Father, saying, he, that come, he said, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And the verse stopped there in Acts 1.5. He left off and with fire because the fire is the baptism of hell and the lake of fire, being immersed and plunged into the lake of fire. You say, another time. Well, you remember when, um, when Peter was talking about Cornelius' conversion in Acts chapter 11, he talked about being baptized with the Holy Ghost, and he quoted Matthew 3.11. He said he baptized you with the Holy Ghost, and he stopped. He didn't say end with fire, because Cornelius was not baptized with fire. In fact, every single person in this room will either be baptized by the Holy Ghost or baptized in fire before the end's over. And when I say the end, you know, whatever, the end of the consummation of God's times all can come up together. You'll be baptized in fire if you don't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, when does the baptism of the Holy Ghost take place? The very second you're saved. Look at Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with, uh, with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. There's a second baptism. And with fire. Now look at verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The last word in verse 10, fire of judgment. The last word in verse 12, fire of judgment. The last word in verse 11 has to be the fire of judgment, according to Acts 1 and Acts 11. That is not the cloven tongues like as of fire. That like as is a simile. It wasn't really the thing. This is the real thing. Now, there's three baptisms by themselves. Uh, take your Bible, turn to Matthew 20. <clears throat> Matthew 20. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 20. Here's the fourth baptism. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 21. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. He saith unto him, Ye shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. He said, You shall. He said, Are you able to be... Listen to me. He's talking about the future here. Are you able to be baptized? They'd already been baptized with John's baptism. You see, anybody to get in the ministry of Christ had to be baptized with John. He said, beginning from the baptism of John until the taking up Jesus Christ into heaven, Acts chapter 1, to be an apostle. From the beginning of the baptism of John, these men have already been baptized in water. He's talking about the baptisms of sufferings. And they were suffered. Peter was crucified. John was put on the Isle of Patmos, boiled in oil. James was Peter, James, and John. Or this is John and James, I should say. John and James. James was killed in Acts chapter 12 with a sword. And John was put on the isle called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now that's the baptism of suffering. And we, we like I said, in the tape on seven baptism, I go in great detail and show that through the Old Testament. <clears throat> David went through that also. Uh, turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. <clears throat> Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, what is that? This is a Gentile baptism. Why? Nations. And you know what kind of baptism? Acts chapter 10. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? That's a Gentile baptism. 
Now turn to uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Like I said, if you want it in detail, get the tape. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. <laughs> no, that's the way the Campbellites say it. They got repent and be baptized. Believe, confess, repent and be baptized. <laughs> he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, not in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and if you're baptized in water, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You say, I thought that's the same as John's baptism. You didn't get the Holy Ghost when you were baptized by John. There's the difference. You see, there's three water baptisms in the, that are explained in the Bible, and they're all different. There's John's baptism, there's a Jewish baptism, and there's a Gentile baptism. All water. And there's a Holy Ghost baptism, which is Holy Spirit baptism, same as what we're talking about in Ephesians 4. There's a baptism of fire, there's a baptism of suffering. Turn to the last one, 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, get your questions ready for the end of the service here. 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Now, fathers, that's Jewish fathers, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Well, here's maybe another baptism, water one. And, all, and, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. A cloud is water. And I've been in some clouds where you can feel the wetness on your face. You know, some fog's moving through a fog's cloud. You know, and you can feel the wetness hit your face. If this isn't baptism by immersion. This is baptism by aspersion, <laughs> where the water's coming up and the Red Sea parted and the thing's roaring on top of the thing up there. Hold, God's holding it back and there's steam and the vapor and the clouds coming over and they're getting a little mist in there. And it's a picture of baptism. Now, wait a minute. Over in Exodus chapter 12, there was a picture of the Passover. They killed the Passover lamb and they were saved nationally. So they, they were saved by the blood, picture of your salvation, and they went out and they were all baptized nationally, going through the Red Sea, running from Moses. A Christian should be baptized after they're saved by the blood. And that's what that whole thing pictures, a remarkable picture. And then it pictures a lot of us wandering 40 years in the wilderness, <laughs> which is a real shame. And then entering in the promised land and crossing the Jordan, a picture of death, and getting in the victory land. All right, now there are seven baptisms. And you see that clearly, he says in Hebrews 6, 2, leaving the doctrine of baptisms. Now, is Paul in error when he says one Lord, one faith, one baptism? No, we've already seen that there's many lords, many uh, gods, and there's many bodies, and there's many faiths. And, but there, see, there's one baptism you better get. Now, out of all those seven baptisms, which one you think you need? The Holy Spirit baptism. And that takes place in salvation. That's not minimizing water baptism for the Gentiles. That's not minimizing that at all, because Paul said Paul did baptize, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and Acts chapter 18, he did baptize in water. All right, now let's look at this uh, Holy Spirit baptism. Turn to Romans chapter 6, Romans 6. <clears throat> now the passages I'm about to take you to, 90% of the Baptists, easy. That's not an overstatement. 90% of the Baptists believe that Romans chapter 6 is water baptism. There's not a drop of water in Romans for three chapters in any direction. And not in this chapter by any stretch of the imagination. It's Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, see the words into? That's serious. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism. Notice we're buried with him. When I baptize somebody in water up here, I'm not, they're not getting buried with Christ. And let me tell you something else. I'm not baptizing somebody into Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, know you not that so many as were baptized into Jesus Christ? That's where you get put into the body. Listen, if that's water baptism, if Romans 6 is water baptism, then water baptism saves you. The baptism of Romans 6 saves, and if it's water, you're a heretic. And you know what you have to do? You have to go run to the Greek to explain this thing. It's what you got to do. I've heard them do it. They say, oh, that word into, that preposition could be something else, and it could be this. 
It's a mess. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. I knew some preachers that baptized, they would baptize, you know what I say, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. I've heard him say that. Hundreds of them. I'm not kidding you. Raised to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. And I'd like to tell you who, but... <laughs> I can't tell you who. I mean, there's some. I'm not afraid to say it, but I just don't. I just don't want to do it. And you don't. You're not w- raised to walk in newness of life, brother. You, you, know, you, you were walking in newness of life where he got in the pool. At least you better have been. That's why I say, uh, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. I changed it. I don't know any preacher that says it that way, but I changed the things. I don't think it's right. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection, not raised to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. Made it sound like that put you in Christ. All right. Turn to Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter 3. That baptism is Holy Spirit in Romans 6. Now turn to Galatians 3. And I'll tell you what, the Campbellites use these verses. The water dogs use these verses to prove that you uh, get saved by water. They say, what about that verse over in 1 Peter 3? Noah was saved by water. (laughs) He was saved from the ungodly. The water lifted up the ark. You You know what? If Noah was saved by water, if the, if the Campbellites could just prove that Noah was in a submarine, they'd have something, wouldn't they? <laughs> if they could just prove Noah was in a submarine, boy, he was saved by but he was on top of the water. The ark lifted up in the air, and the water destroyed the ungodly in the world. Galatians chapter 3, verse 20. Look at verse 25. Galatians 3, 25. <clears throat> but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. See the word faith in 25? You've got to underline faith. 26. For ye are all the children of God. Is that true? No, it's not true. Because I didn't finish the verse. Ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. You ought to underline the word faith. Why? Verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If that's water baptism, the way to get Christ on is get baptized into Christ and you put him on. But that's not it. Verse 26 and 27, or 25 and 26 has said faith. Now look at verse 28. How do you know verse 27 is spirit instead of physical? Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Just, you know why you're wearing clothes tonight? We don't say because it's cold. <laughs> You, oh, you know, if it was uh, 90 degrees out, you know why you wear clothes? Because there's male and female, physically. Right here he's talking spiritually. There's ne- when you're in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So verse 27 has to be spiritually also, or you're a water dog. <laughs> That's all i got to say. He says, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Is that water or spirit? Verse 28 demands it's spirit baptism. Because there is male and female physically, but not spiritually. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> when he says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, don't you think Paul's talking about spirit baptism after mentioning it in Romans 6 and Galatians 3 and Colossians 2 and 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body? He's mentioned it in four other books. When he says one spirit, it's Holy Spirit, not water. Colossians 2, verse 11. Colossians 2.11. Let's read 10. And you are complete in Him. See, once you're saved, you don't need to go seeking after the gifts. You don't have to go seeking after the Holy Ghost and tongues and everything else. Once you're saved, you're complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Is that physical or spiritual? Ah, see how that thing runs spiritual? You're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I mean, women get circumcised too when they're saved. But it's a spiritual cutting away. And he says, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the what? Not through the preacher. 
through the faith. It's through faith. Now, you're not raised by the preacher. You're raised through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. It's an operation. You have an operation. You, you know, you say, you'd like to get saved? Instead of asking me, you'd like to get saved? You'd like to have an operation? Scare them to death. <laughs> you wouldn't get many results that way, would you? <laughs> How would you like an operation? Just bow your head. <laughs> Who would want to bow their head for prayer might think you're going to operate on them. But, you know, when you got saved, you were operating on it whether you realized it or not. I didn't know it for months after I got saved. I thought I had major surgery. People say, you ever been to major surgery? Oh, yes, without an anesthetic. <laughs> no anesthetic. Uh, you have any stitches? Oh, that was a bad one. But notice here he says, he says again in verse, now watch this again, verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made Without hands. Listen, brother, when I baptize somebody, I baptize them with hands. I use hands. That with hands is with the without hands is very important. So because he says there's no period after verse eleven, buried with him in baptism, without hands. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together. When did that quickening take place? The second you got saved. You have quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, that bat, look, when, see, when you got baptized by the Holy Spirit, that's the point you had your trespasses forgiven. And that don't take place in the pool. All right? Back to Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> <coughs> Ephesians 4. <coughs> so, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 7. And unto every one of us is, great, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You know what a measure is? <clears throat> you measure something with that. Not every Christian has the same amount of grace. Some Christians have more grace than others. And he says in verse 7, But unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Uh, according, yeah, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Christ has to measure out. says, well, I'm going to give this person this much. I'll give them this much. You can ask for it. You can ask for more grace. He said, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. You can go to get grace. And the Bible says the word of his grace which is able to build you up. The word of his grace which is able to build you up. Acts 20. There's all kind of places you can get grace if you want more grace. And he'll give it to you according, according to your faith. Now turn to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans 12. Romans 12. Grace is not the only thing that... Uh, see, not all Christians have the same amount of grace. There's something else that Christians don't have the same amount of. Romans 12.3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, hey, I mean, I mean I'm going to use a carnal illustration. You sit there and you deal out cards. You deal, dealt. Is the, have, you, have you dealt them yet? Yes. You deal them out. You don't know what you're getting. One guy picks it up, he got a royal flush. Say, Preacher, how do you know that? <laughs> Pick it up and he's got a straight. <laughs> you know whatever, you say, boy, I've got a hand. See, each guy got dealt something different. See that thing? It's dealt. He dealt to every man the measure of faith. So there's di some Christians have more faith than others. And he talks about faith. In, in fact, I think Romans 12 talks about faith up there. Uh, look at verse 4. For as... We have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. See, according to the grace that's given, different grace. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he, he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Giving money is a gift. It takes grace, man, to give. And he said, He that uh, giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Some people are able to show more mercy than others. That's a gift to be able to have mercy on people. And uh, another place talks about faith. And faith is a gift. I mean, it's a gift for Christians. I know it's a gift to get saved, but it's also a gift afterwards. 
<clears throat> and you can have your faith increased by reading the scriptures. All right, now Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, now look at parentheses. See the parentheses? When he gave gifts to men, what's the gifts? Verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. See that thing? That's the gift. How do you know? Well, look at verse 9. Do you have a parenthesis after verse nine, the number 9? See a parenthesis? The parenthesis ends at the end of verse 10. So therefore, anytime you see a parenthesis in your Bible, to get the sense, do this. Verse 8. And then and read 8 and then skip to 11. Watch it. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some... See how that thing makes sense? That's the gifts. So if you ever wonder, now, there's, now we go back and read the parenthesis. Verse 8 again. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led, that's quoted out of um, uh, Psalm 68, 18. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended one up, what is it but that he also descended first? You ought to circle that word first. He descended first. Before he ascended, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So Christ, when he died on the cross, went to the center of the earth. He says in uh, Matthew 12, verse 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights, not six foot under, in the heart of the earth. That's the center, the middle. You talk about the heart of a watermelon or the heart of a piece of fruit. That's the center. And it says in Acts chapter 2, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Also in Psalm 16. So Jesus Christ went down into hell. He said, why did he go there? For several reasons. He went down and preached to the spirits in prison. And he went down there triumphing, making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He's down there jumping up and down, praise the Lord. <laughs> he's, dumping, he's, down, he's jumping up and down. He's making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The Bible says over there, And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. That's Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. The verse before it says, For it is appointed that men once to die, but after this the judgment. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Jesus Christ became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All the sin of the world was poured out on Christ. He unloaded it in hell. He was not a better place to unload sin. He, did, he became sin. He deposited sin and off, dumped it off, got rid of it. Now, uh, Christ went to the center of the earth. Not only did he do that, he led captivity captive. He led captivity. Who's that? There's some people down in the center of the earth that are on the paradise side of hell. That's why the, the rich man and Lazarus in his bosom, he seeth, uh, the rich man seeth Lazarus afar off and said, Lazarus! Or he said, Abraham, <laughs> send Lazarus, then may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And he said, thou, thou in thy lifetime receivest good things, and likewise Lazarus evil. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Remember that? You remember the story, Luke 16. That's the center of the earth. And it was down there, and all the Old Testament saints were down there. They couldn't be in the presence of God because their sins were not taken away. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. He's, that's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Old Testament uh, sacrifices could only forgive sins and remit sins. It says, which by no means can clear the guilty, Exodus 34, 7. So Jesus Christ went down there. Remember when Jonah says in Jonah chapter 2, the, the hell, he said, the belly, in the belly of hell cried I, and the earth with her bars were about me. Jonah died. He went down into the center of the earth, and he said, out of the belly of hell cried I, and the earth with her bars were about me. That wasn't the ribs of the whale, I guarantee it. That, that was talking about in the belly of hell. He was in hell. Jesus Christ said that, you see. He said he's going to die, and Jonah died. Otherwise, it's the swoon theory, and Christ didn't die. He just kind of in the coolness of the tomb, revived, and his wounds healed, and uh, he didn't really die. But he did, like Jonah did. So Jesus Christ went down, and he says, when he ascended up on a high, he led captivity captive. He took those captives out down there and made them captives up there. Now, I wouldn't mind being a captive of the Lord. <laughs> So I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Boy, I wish he'd come get me. <laughs> Take me up there. 
Now I'm ready to go. And so he led captivity captive. He took them up there with him. And he gave gifts unto men. Now, if you need any more on that, we'll ask questions at the end of the service. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So hell is in the center of the earth. The lake of fire somewhere else. Hell and the lake of fire are not the same. Because it says, death and hell delivered up the dead which are in them. And they, the books were open, which was the book of life. And they said that they were judged out of the things which were written in those books. And if their name wasn't found in the book of life, then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's a different thing. Hell is like the county jail. The lake of fire is like the state prison. It's different. You go on trial here, and then you're put into the prison. You get the death sentence. All right, verse uh, 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, now notice now, these are gifts. He gave gifts unto men. And there's, there's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is for what? Character. The gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 is for power. And the gifts that God's giving here is for ministering. And I'm, I'm going to say it plainly. I don't really like to say this, but I mean, I don't want to skip over it. I believe it's true that these gifts are God's love gift to the church. These gifts are God's love gift to the church. And that's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the winning of souls, verse 12. Is that what it says? Uh-uh. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. I couldn't wait to say that. So now I said it. Now I feel better. Let's come. <laughs> let's look at some more. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles. That, now that's Jewish apostles. Because truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and, and wonders and mighty deeds. That's Second Corinthians 12, 12. And there's no apostles today. And some prophets. The prophets went past Acts 28. Because not all the scripture had been written yet. There were prophets past Acts 28. Now this thing is chronological. Verse 11 is chronological. And some evangelists. There's not really, really evangelists today. Now what am I talking about? Now you think with me. This is chronological. There were apostles, then prophets, then evangelists. You know what's left today? Pastors and teachers. Now why do I say there's not evangelists? You name me a young evangelist. You name me a young one pretty rough, man. I mean, people like Fred Brown and B.R. Lakin, that's the leftover evangelist. Then Fred, Brown, Fred Brown's alive. B.R. Lakin died now. And I heard those men in person and talked to them. Fred Brown, B.R. Lakin, boy, those are state guys could preach. And they go around the country. You see, but the evangelists today aren't evangelists like they were in the old Bible times. You know how the evangelists in the last, oh, the, really the last great, I, I'm going to have to admit it. I'll admit it. Billy Sunday and Billy Graham. Now, why is Billy Graham a great evangelist? Because he doesn't need a church to get a crowd. You see, these evangelists we got today have to go to churches to get a crowd. They can't go to an auditorium and go, dun 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 It was 50,000 people every night. You see, that doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't happen. They have to depend on who? The pastors and teachers. And they go from church to church to church and Billy Graham is just, the, he's just, he's just apostatizing, just fading out. That's it, man. That's it. You don't know any young evangelist today. It just isn't a way, I mean, that's, if you're thinking about getting evangelism, you're getting in a bad, bad situation today. And I'm telling that kindly. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to help you to avoid a problem. Because this is chronological. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some, there's no apostles or prophets left. And some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And uh, these pastors and teachers, no, pastors and teachers, there's no comma after word pastor, like there is after apostle, like there is after prophets, like there is after evangelist. See, there's pastors and teachers. A pastor is to be a teacher. That's why it says the qualification of a pastor, he has to be apt to teach. And if he can't teach, he shouldn't be in the ministry. If he's going to get up and just holler and rant and rave and preach in a 40 subject over and over and over again or something, he's not called to preach, man. Or he's not to be a pastor. He can go out and do evangelism in churches or go around and bounce around in churches if he wants. I mean, he'd do a good job for churches. So he says again, and some pastors and teachers. 
And so, look what he says, what are they for? Semicolon after 11. For the perfecting of the saints. Not unsaved people. Pastors and teachers are for the perfecting, of, not for winning souls. That's the job of every Christian. That's the walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. That's you, that's you, that's you, that's me. We're all to be witnesses. And they say, well, that's what we're paying the preacher to do. No, you're not. And you better get another one if you think you are. <laughs> you know, I'm, you're, I'm here to edify the saints and build up the body of Christ and for the perfecting of the saints. Why? Boy, this is good. <laughs> the Lord knows how to write the Bible, man. Verse 12. And I'm not, not that I'm you know, using it to justify anything, but look at this. For the perfecting of the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry. You perfect the saints. Why do you perfect the saints? So the saints can minister. You go to the nursing homes, you go to the jails, you go around, you do all kind of things. You minister so you can be out and be witnesses. I mean, listen, if you've got 50 people witnessing, you do a lot better job than one person witnessing. If the pastor's doing his job right, you'll win a lot more souls with 50 to 100 doing it than one person knocking on doors. So he says the pastors and teachers are for, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. My job is to edify the whole body of Christ. Not just the local church. That's why we got tapes going on all over the place. And, you know, some of the college students, I hope you don't, but I know you will. <laughs> some of them are going to, you know, within a couple of years or whatever, they'll be out somewhere else. They'll be in other states, other cities, and they'll be edifying the body of Christ with things they've learned and help other people. And we're doing a good missionary work. Just get them in here, teach them a couple of years, bang, they're out. I hope they get jobs here and stick around. But that's not always God's purpose and plan. <clears throat> for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long, Lord? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, <laughs> unto the measure and stature, the fullness of Christ. He said it will happen till we all come to the perfect man. No, oh, there it is again. We'll all be men in heaven. <laughs> until we come to the perfect man, and he says, uh, that'll be, you know where that is. That, that's in heaven. I guarantee it. And, you know, we can also take, the, he's talking collectively, but you can also take verse 13 individually. He said, we'll, we'll perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Uh, that's when you're complete and whole, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He when all the cells are in, when all the cells get in that body, boy, it's going to go, man. <laughs> And uh, you might be the last one to win, to win, that, win that last person to Christ. You'd be down there bowing. You say, let's pray. Say, yes, I'd like to get saved. And you say, in Jesus' name, amen. And you're, all of a sudden you look up and you go, man, where are we at? <laughs> what happened? You'd be in the presence of God right there, a the bright light shining in the face. Now, I'm not, you know, well, I'll just let it go. I'll let, you, I'll let you go with that. So when the body is complete, then the rapture will take place. That's why he said the body of Christ till we all come to the perfect man and the fullness of Christ. When all the cells are in, we're going to go. Uh, well, I kind of wanted to save verse 14 for later, but let's take it. <clears throat> that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, and by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You ought to memorize that verse. That verse is powerful. And so the purpose of a pastor is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, edifying of the body of Christ. Why? That would be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro. A bunch of baby, baby Christians. He's telling Christians to grow up. Grow up. And uh, you can, I mean, you, you haven't arrived yet. I guarantee it. Paul said, I, I've not, I've not, I'm not uh, arrived being already perfect. Philippians chapter 3. You haven't arrived, man. You've got a lot of growing up to do. That would be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro like a ship in the water being tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. It's like, you know, the wind's blowing that ship back and forth in the water and it's going this way and going that way. It's out of control. You're not to be that way. You're to have control of that thing. Be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, hot air. A lot of preachers just blowing out hot air, spewing out of their mouth, steam, just hot air. And with every wind of doctrine, <clears throat> by the slight of men. You ever heard of sleight of hand? The sleight of hand? That's a magician. The sleight of hand is like is, the sleight of men is to trick or to fool. The sleight of men and cunning craftiness. That smooth, slick talk. 
By good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16, verse 18. So he says, watch out for the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they what? Lie in wait to deceive. They're waiting for you. And you know, when you win somebody to Jesus Christ, the buzzards always show up. I'm telling you, I call them buzzards, and they're buzzards, brother. You get somebody saved, you know who shows up? The charismatic show up, and I don't give a flip who listens to this tape, because I know who some people that will be, and they won't like it a bit. But those buzzards hang around, and they don't give a flip about souls. They wait for the Baptist or somebody to win them to Christ. I've heard them call me from California. I said, did you visit that man in the nursing home? He was dying. And she goes, I knew you Baptists would tell She said it like that. Remember, it was about a month, two months ago. I knew you Baptists. You're always caring about souls. After I got talking to her, I said, are you a charismatic? She goes, yes, I am. Oh, praise you, Jesus. And talking on the phone. She goes, you Baptists really, I, that's right, we care about souls. They don't give a flip about souls. All they care about is... Speaking in tongues and, and going around with some exotic experience, they're just, they're just selfish and carnal and, and, and proud is all they are. And you better get a hold of that, you. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Makes me mad. And you know what they do? They lie and wait to deceive. When I got saved, I worked at a hospital. When I worked there, nobody witnessed to me one time. Until a Baptist talked to me, Jeff Musser, and told me how to get saved. He cared about my soul. And I started telling people I was saved, witnessing the, oh, oh, here's a book. Hey, listen to this. Come to church with me. And I, I worked, there's 2,700.